Well, good morning to everybody. And since my wife and I will be leaving town tomorrow, I won't be preaching next Sunday, and I won't be preaching the Sunday after that. Next Sunday, Tyler will be preaching, and I hope you'll come. He'll do a good job. He always does. The Sunday after that, on the January the 2nd, my wife and I will be going on the winter retreat with the teenagers. We are going to be servants to help do things that need to be done around the camp there. So, since I won't see you for a while, I just want to say, as this graphic says, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to every single one of you. Uh, I want to point something out that I pointed out last week. You guys see this jar up here? My wife has done a good job of making a little banner around it. It says Christmas for Kids. We just recently used that money that you guys gave throughout this past year. We used that to help the poor children in Biola Battery. That's a mission effort that we have. When uh, some of our folks went down there and took the Christmas presents that you guys donated, they took them to those poor children, and they used this money that we collected over the year to have a Christmas party with them. And what you guys gave them for Christmas, that's the only Christmas they're going to get. And so I want to give you a challenge. I've already done this. Uh, I want to challenge you to put $5 a month in here. Now, think about it. It doesn't sound like much. No, $5 a month is not much. But if a bunch of people do $5 a month, $5 a month is $60 a year. If only 10 people do it, 10 people put 5 bucks a month in, that will be $600 in that. So I want to encourage you. I've already done it. I'm going to keep doing that at least that much, minimal that much. I hope this jar gets full. We'll be able to help the kids at Biola Battery. We'll be able to help other poor and needy children at Christmas. We've been given a lot, and it's our duty and honor and privilege to be able to give back to other people, right? So I saw some little children before service coming up here, and they were putting their money in here. Keep doing that. It's not just for kids. It's for adults also because we want to be a blessing to other people. Well, today is the second in this series and the last, because I won't be here for a while. We're talking about the miracle of the incarnation. The incarnation is this doctrine that Ken did a good job of leading us in songs about. I love these Christmas songs. If you'll pay attention to the words on these songs, there's a lot of really good Bible teaching in those songs. He rules the world, joy to the, Lord, the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive its king. The miracle of the incarnation is this. God came to the earth in the form of a human being. And today, we're going to look at what John's gospel says about this. You know, a lot of times, as Ken did this morning in the call to worship, we, we focus on what Matthew's gospel says about it, and that's appropriate to do so. And we fo focus on what Luke's gospel says about the, the shepherds, the announcement made to the shepherds, and the, the wise men coming, which was probably about a year and a half to two years later. Uh, but we focus on those passages, but there are lots of other passages that are literally sprinkled all throughout the entire New Testament that talk about the miracle of the incarnation. And so we're going to talk about what John's gospel talks about today. And the reason John is going to say what he's going to say, here's why. Jesus was being distorted in John's day. There was false teaching going on about Jesus and specifically some people were saying this this is what was prevalent thinking in their society well Jesus wasn't really God he just seemed like God because their thinking was God can't dwell in a fleshly form he can't dwell in matter because matter is evil in their thinking and so what John is going to do is He's going to use some language that is going to connect with them to get them to think differently. And you might be saying, well, what does this have to do with us? Here's what it has to do with us. Jesus is being distorted today as well. Teaching about God and who God is and about Jesus, his son, who is also God, as I'll plainly show you this morning, he is being distorted. And what we as Christians need, we are influenced by the thinking of the world, aren't we? Like the church that John was writing to, he was concerned that they were being influenced. These Christians were being influenced by the prevalent thinking of the world. And I'm concerned, and all of us should be, and we know that we are influenced also by the prevalent thinking of our society. And there is a thinking, a way of looking at things, a worldview in our society that has taken hold over the last couple of decades, and it's this New Age movement. And this New Age movement... This modernism has a lot of, 
uh, uh, pagan background in it, even though people don't know it. And actually what it does is it takes a bunch of teaching from Eastern religions, Buddhism and Hinduism primarily, and it distorts who God is and it distorts who Jesus is based on what that says. And so what John is going to do, he is going to use some terminology that they would have been familiar with. He takes terminology so that they would have already known, but he's going to give it a deeper meaning that they never would have thought of. And so he's going to bring about in his first passage in John, this is one of the greatest passages in the entire Bible. And John says, inspired by God, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God he was in the beginning with all, with God and all things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of men powerful passage this is one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible and there's a whole bunch in this and I'm going to come back to this in a minute as we're going to unpack this but first I want to show you this picture this is a real picture from the Hubble telescope. It's a picture of a bunch of galaxies. This is just one little small point in space, and there are thousands of galaxies. Some of them appear brighter than others. That's because the others are further in distance. All those little white dots you see up there are galaxies. Now, though science is not an exact science, you might say, they guess at a lot of things, but it has been estimated by scientists that there are between a hundred billion and two trillion galaxies in the universe. Now, I want you to think about what a galaxy is. Each one of these hundred billion to two trillion galaxies, each one of them, like our own galaxy that we live in, it's called the Milky Way galaxy. Each one of these galaxies, like ours, has on average a hundred billion stars within each of those hundred billion to two trillion galaxies. And each of those galaxies, the distance across a galaxy, like this galaxy right here, the average distance across is a hundred thousand light years. Now you say, well, that doesn't mean much to me. What's a light year? Here's what a light year is. A light year is the distance that light travels in a year. Let me give you some scale. Light travels at approximately 186,300 miles per second. In one second, light laps the entire world, which is approximately 25,000 miles around. It laps it seven and a half times in one second. And going that fast, it takes 100,000 years to get across the average size galaxy. And on top of that, to blow your mind even more, each of these 100 billion to 2 trillion galaxies are on average one million light years separated from each other. Now, if you're me, or if you're like me, you might be thinking, man, what in the world keeps all of this matter and all of this energy and all of this space and all of this incredible complexity, what keeps it all together and functioning in such an orderly way that we observe in our universe? What is it that does that well John's going to introduce a word here that I'm going to show you in just a second and actually it's a word that the Greeks already knew about see ancient civilization was largely influenced by the Greek their philosophy and they had this term that they coined called logos in English that means word and I'll get back to you in just a second this logos they believe here's what the logos is they said, all this can't just happen by itself, and it can't just function by itself. There has to be some ordering principle behind it all that keeps it all together and makes it all work. And that ordering principle, which they thought was something that was inanimate and abstract, they called that the logos. I want to read this definition to you. This is from a, a, a Greek noble of Ephesus. His name is Heraclitus. He lived in about 500 B.C. before Jesus. He said this. He said, the universe operates according to a rational structure. A unified ordering principle, which we can discern, 
if we carefully observe its patterns and solve its many riddles. And according to this theory, all the laws of physics, mathematics, reason, and morality, they can be traced to this one ordering principle, which is called logos, or the word. Other philosophers adopted this idea, going so far as to describe the word as a divine animating principle that permeates everything in the universe. Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher, he was heavily influenced by Plato, he taught that the Logos was God's creative principle, and it was necessary because God, in the realm of pure thought, cannot have any direct association with anything in the tangible realm of matter. At least, that is what they thought and what they thought at the time. And so John, speaking to that kind of thinking, says this. In the beginning was the word that's that greek term logos in the beginning was the logos and the logos was with god and the logos was god he's saying what you call a divine ordering principle behind everything there is something behind everything that's keeping it together that's making it work he says that's true but it's not an abstract thought or principle at all it's actually a divine being it is God who is behind all this and this concept of word uh, is something kind of fascinating you know when we think of a word just the society in which we live in all we think of is sound like right now you can hear the sound of my voice and all we think was well, just a word ancient people didn't think that way the Greeks didn't think that way the Jews didn't think that way they believed a word actually did something. There was, there was weight behind a word. It accomplished something. It had power. It had energy. And things got done when you spoke. And actually, even in our culture, there, there are things where we can look back to and we can say, you know, because something was spoken, things happened. Think about the opening lines of the book of Genesis, for example. What did God do to create the world? He spoke. He spoke everything into existence. And when he spoke, stuff started happening. And in our own culture, in our own time, there are speeches that have been given by people that were very powerful that stuff started happening because they made those speeches. For example, in 1961, at a joint session of Congress, President John F. Kennedy stood up before this joint session of Congress, and he challenged him. He said, before the end of this decade... It is our goal in the United States of America to put a man on the moon, which seemed incredible and ludicrous at the time. But you know what? Before the end of the decade, just barely, but they did do it. July 20th, 1969, we put a man on the moon. You might remember the incredible I Have a Dream speech of Martin Luther King. That speech was powerful, and things started happening. Civil rights legislation, the civil rights movement, as a result of that. You might remember uh, one time President Reagan was giving a speech. The speech was on June the 12th, 1987. He was over in West Germany. And on June the 12th, 1987, with the, the Berlin Wall in the background that was built in 1961 to separate communist East Germany from West Germany to prevent the people in East Germany from escaping to the West where they'd have freedom, Mr. Reagan said this. You remember this? He said, Mr. Gorbachev, who was the president of the Soviet Union at the time? Tear down this wall. Two years later, they did in 1989. Powerful, powerful. Words have power. They do things. And so, he says, in the beginning was this word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. This thing that you call a principle is not a principle at all. It's a being. It's God. And then he says... He was with God in the beginning. And the he that he's talking about, as we'll get to in a little bit, the he is talking about Jesus. There's a lot of false teaching that was going on in John's day about Jesus, that he was a created being and he wasn't really God and all that. There's a lot of false teaching about Jesus today. Look at what this said. There has never been a time when Jesus did not exist. Yes, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the flesh. That's true. But Jesus, as far as a divine being, has always existed. There was a never, never was a time when he was not. Because, as this says, 
Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. That is who he was. He came down here in the form of a human being, but he was God, and he was always there. There's never been a time when Jesus wasn't. And then he says this, Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Now here's why this matters for us today. Whether you're aware of it or not, I hope you'll go do a little research, but trust me, it's true. We're heavily influenced right now, though you might not know it, but we are. We're heavily influenced by New Age thought because that is kind of the spirit of our age that is kind of taking hold, isn't it? New Age thought gets a lot of its thinking from Eastern religions, from Buddhism and Hinduism. And here's one of the things that Buddhism and Hinduism teach. They teach basically that the created stuff, the creation, physical matter, physical things are God. And John says, no, through him all things were created. Those things were created by God, but those things are not God. Even in our culture in the United States, a lot of times, you know, you hear people talk about Mother Nature. Oh, thank goodness for Mother Nature. Oh, Mother Nature did. Let me tell you something. That's a pagan idea. I did a little research on it back this week. You know what actually goes back to pagan Greek philosophy? There's no such thing as Mother Nature. There is nature, but what's behind nature? God is behind nature. Mother Nature doesn't do anything. The only, thing that in, the only reason that anything happens is because God is behind it all and making it happen. And then he says, In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. This is what people are looking for. They always have. All human beings instinctively know because they're born and we're created in the image of God. All human beings know that we have a purpose. We're here for a reason. We're not just taking up space. And so people all throughout history have always tried lots of different kind of things to find fulfillment and meaning and purpose in their life. And many of these things are destructive. There might be somebody in here right now who, if you're honest with yourself, you've been trying to find meaning and purpose in life in lots of different ways alcoholism drug addiction addiction to pornography or other kind of uh, sexual issues worldliness money power all those kind of things the reason people keep trying it and try to keep adding more and more and more is because it never satisfies this verse says in him was life and that life was the light of men. I love this verse in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Why did Jesus come? Well, he came for a lot of reasons. He came to save us, obviously, but he also came to give us a full and complete life. He wants your life now, and he wants my life now to be fulfilling. He wants it to be meaningful. He wants it to be full of purpose, and it will be but only when we make him the number one thing that's in our life. We can't have anything else before him. And then he goes on, and he says this later on down. This is in verse 14. He says, the word, that logos, that was with God, that was God. He says, that word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, who was full of grace and truth. This verse right here, this is verse 14 of John's Gospel. This verse right here is one of, one of the things, one of the many things, that makes Christianity unique. And here's why it is unique. This verse says that God became flesh. He became a human being. Jesus was born in that manger in Bethlehem, and then he grew up to about the age of 33 and was crucified on the cross. He was a literal human being, just like you and I are. The Word became flesh. That is a radical concept. Now, you and I don't think it's all that radical because we've grown up hearing it. And we've grown up with copies of our Bible. But I guarantee you, the first people that heard that, they thought, are you out of your mind? Because most people's concept of God is that God is distant. He is way out there beyond those galaxies that I showed you just a second ago. And he's usually in a bad mood. And he doesn't want to come down here and have anything to do with us. John says, no. God humbled himself and he came to this earth in the form of a human being and limited himself so that he could identify with us. 
No human being would have thought that up. This is one of the great proofs of the truthfulness of Scripture. There was, that's unprecedented in human history to think that God is like that. Where'd that idea come from? John didn't make this idea up. He never would have made that up. It, God inspired him to write this. The Word became flesh. He made his dwelling among us. And then he says, Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace. Already given. Because the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want anybody to take wrong what this verse says because there's a lot of false teaching on this today. A lot of people, some of us even sometimes, will catch ourselves saying, well, I'm so glad that I live under the era of grace and not like the Old Testament when there's no grace. That is not true, brothers and sisters. Go read your Old Testament again. You know, during Bible class, Chip gave a challenge to everybody to read through that uh, chronological Bible this year, which I would encourage you to do. God has always been a God of grace. There aren't two gods, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. One God, he's a God of grace. His grace has just been manifested to an even greater degree in New Testament times. And then to us, he says, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. This is just a way of saying, which is why it's translated in so many different ways in our versions. No matter how much you've messed up, no matter how much you've sinned, no matter how badly you have sinned, God always has grace and he has more grace in place of that. It reminds me of a verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where Paul said one time, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And Mike's translation to that is, where you have royally messed up, God still has grace for you. You can't mess up so much that God's grace won't cover it if you will turn to him. And that's really good news. And then he says in verse 18, no one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God is in closest relationship with the Father, and he has made him known. You know, there's a lot of people today who have a lot of different uh, teachings about God. Who is God? What is he like? What's his nature like? And so on and so forth. John says, you want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. What, what's God like? Look at Jesus. Incredibly compassionate caring of other people, thoughtful of other people, incredibly kind and loving, full of truth and mercy and grace and uprightness and holiness, always putting others ahead of himself, a servant. What is God like? That is what God is like. And the reason Jesus came to this earth, he came here to give us a living picture of what God's like because most of us need pictures not abstractions. That's why you probably noticed I preach with pictures. I get pictures all the time. Why? Because that helps us to connect. And so Jesus came to show us in living color what God is like. I heard this story about uh, a grandfather. He was babysitting his three-year-old grandson for the weekend. He read him a story, tucked him in, and then he went downstairs to watch a, the, a television program. Well, while he was watching the show, a terrible thunderstorm came up with lightning and loud thunder, and the little boy shouted downstairs from his upstairs room. He says, Grandpa, I'm scared. Come up here and protect me. And the grandfather, who was being engrossed in his television show, he shouted back. He said, Don't worry. You'll be all right. You know that God loves you. And the crying little boy shouted back, Yes, I know God loves me, but right now I need somebody with skin on. That's who Jesus was. He was God with skin on. He was God in the flesh. Now, I want to boil this all down to one prevailing thought that I think these verses summarize. It's this right here. Only in Christ can your life have fullness and order. Just because we're Christians, most of us are, doesn't mean that sometimes our life doesn't get out of order and we start seeking the wrong thing sometimes, does it? Sometimes we get out of kilter and we start thinking that we can find meaning and we can find purpose and we can find fulfillment and some other things. And sometimes we try those things. And you know what I've discovered over the years, every time I've tried that, gotten off the path a little bit, it's really not fulfilling after all. And this is why, because it's only in Christ. This is why we were created. This is the purpose for which we were created. Only in Christ can our life really have fullness and meaning and purpose in order 
I love this great verse in the book of Hebrews. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. I showed you all those galaxies a second ago. You think about the world, just the world, the earth in which we live right now. The sun came up this morning as it does every day. Actually, it didn't come up as we all know. It came around. We're on a spinning sphere, the earth, which is about 25,000 miles in circumference. And the reason the day is 24 hours long is because we're spinning right now at approximately 1,000 miles an hour. I know it, it feels normal, but we're spinning really fast, 1,000 miles an hour right now. What's holding all this together? What keeps everything from just flying apart? Well, science says, well, it's the laws of science and all that. Yeah, the laws of science, but where'd those laws come from? The inspired writer says, I'll tell you what's making it all work, God. Jesus is upholding everything. Why did the sun come up today or come around? <laughs> because Jesus made it come around. Literally without Jesus behind everything, everything would completely fall apart. You talk about all of the incredible constants that have to be in place in order for everything to work. There's something in science called the gravitational constant. That means it's such a power, gravity's there at such a force all the time. If that is off just a little bit, one way or the other, everything falls apart. Why does it stay the same all the time? Well, it's not just science. Yeah, there's science, but who made the science to keep it there? Jesus. He upholds everything by the word of his power. And I love what Paul says in the book of Colossians. In him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. The things we can see, the things we can't see. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. And then he says, all things have been created through him and for him. If you ever get confused about why you're here, what your purpose is, what you're supposed to be doing here, look at this verse. You were created for God. To bring glory and honor to him to expend your life for him and your life is going to be full of meaning and purpose and happiness only to the extent that we live that way and then he continues in verse 17 and he says he is before all things now listen to this I love this little phrase and in him all things hold together now think about that for a minute do you ever get at times have times throughout the course of the year where it feels like your life is falling apart? That ever happened to y'all? Yeah, it feels like everything is just spinning out of order and there's chaos and it's random and it's hectic and my life is just out of order and it's chaotic and everything is falling apart. You want to know why that is? He tells us because it's only in him that all things hold together. And when those times happen, we try to patch up our life with all different kind of things, and we usually end up making it worse. Do y'all ever? Do y'all know any people? Unfortunately, sometimes maybe it's us. But do you know any people? I do several. Won't mention their names, but their life is a constant soap opera. From one crisis to another, from one calamity to another, all the time, and they're just always discombobulated. You know anybody like that? The reason their life is like that is because they don't understand why they were created and what their purpose is. It's only in Christ that your life can have fullness and meaning and purpose in order. And I hope today that the preaching of this word has power to change somebody's life. Maybe there's somebody that needs to hear that. Maybe somebody watching online. In fact, I know there is. Just by observing as a casual observer our world we need to make Jesus the center of everything and when we do that he's going to bring purpose and meaning in order to your life and as a result of that great great joy and maybe there's somebody today who needs to respond to that let's all be standing as we sing this song of encouragement